Welcome back to Physical Anthropology. Today we're looking at Chapter 3, which is Molecular Biology and Genetics. The topics we're going to be discussing are the different kinds of cells and their structure, including bacteria versus animal cells, what DNA structure looks like, what a chromosome is, and how DNA replicates, the cell cycle, including cell division, such as mitosis and meiosis, protein synthesis, including the processes of transcription and translation, Mendelian inheritance, and how we can predict genetics using Punnett squares, and finally, some more complex genetics. So what are prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells? They are two different types of cells that are very easy to distinguish under a microscope based on their internal structures. So prokaryotic cells have no nucleus, and they were the first cell type to develop. They st still exist today in our bacteria cells and our archaea, which are special type of unicellular organisms that live in the um, very extreme environments such as salt lakes, hot springs, um, extreme cold, and things like that. In comparison, eukaryotic cells do have a nucleus, as well as many other organelles. And animal cells are a type of eukaryotic cells. There are other types of eukaryotic cells such as plants and fungi, but we're gonna be focusing on animals today. So when we look at the structure of these cells, you can see that the prokaryotic cell is very simple. There's not much going on on the inside. You do have some DNA here, but the DNA is just hanging out in the middle. There's no membrane surrounding it. There's liquid around it called the cytosol. And there will also be some ribosomes, which are not pictured in this one, but there would be some ribosomes as well floating around. In addition, the prokaryotic cells often have a cell wall on the outside for protection and to maintain the shape of the cell. They also tend to have projections such as pili and fimbria, which are used for attachment. And then many of them can propel themselves through uh, aquatic environments using flagella. This specific example in this picture is E. coli, which is a type of bacterium that can be found in the human gut and also um, in many other animals. Some of them are non-harmful, they're just kind of hanging out. Some of them can cause disease. So if you've ever had food poisoning, it's possible that it was caused by E. coli. On the right, we have a typical animal cell. So animal cells do have a nucleus. That's one of the most identifiable features right here. This really large blob is the nucleus, and the nucleus is where the DNA is hanging out. So unlike the prokaryotic where the DNA was kind of floating around, this one is inside of a membrane, and that's the nucleus. There's also um, an internal structure within the nucleus called the nucleolus, and then all of these other labeled parts are organelles with unique functions inside of the cell. So let's look at some of these functions. Let's first look at ribosomes. Prokaryotic cells also do have ribosomes. Ribosomes are the location where protein synthesis takes place. Next, we have rough and smooth endoplasmic reticulum. In general, the ER or endoplasmic reticulum is used for transportation purposes. What will happen is the ribosomes are on top of the rough ER, that's where it got its name from, is that there's actually ribosomes attached to it, and it's going to be transporting those proteins produced by the ribosomes. In comparison, the smooth ER, smooth endoplasmic reticulum, does not have ribosomes attached to it, but it can synthesize lipids and is involved in that process as well. On the other side, we have the mitochondria. Mitochondria, you may have heard of, is used for energy production. So we uh, create a molecule called ATP that the cell will use for energy. Lysosomes can be used to help protect the cell in case of foreign invaders. So if something tries to invade it like a bacteria or virus, the lysosome has special enzymes that can be used to degrade those uh, objects. In addition, it can use enzymes to degrade cellular components when it's recycling old parts. The Golgi body is used to transport things outside of the cell. So usually the rough ER transports within the cell and then those uh, molecules can actually come over here to 
the Golgi body, which will continue to process them and then eventually send them out of the cell in their own vesicle. Centrioles are used for cell division, both mitosis and meiosis. So they uh, form something called spindles, which helps chromosomes move. And then microtubules are protein structures used to create the shape of the cell. So this cell here is a very typical round cell, but there are many other cells in the body that have unique shapes, such as very elongated, or they may have projections coming off of them, and the microtubules will help maintain that shape. So now let's look at DNA specifically. DNA is the molecule of life, and you've probably heard it called a double helix. So this is the shape of a DNA molecule. There's another kind of molecule that's related to it called RNA. RNA is a little bit different. So DNA is called deoxyribonucleic acid. RNA refers to ribonucleic acid. Notice that this one is single-stranded, while deoxyribonucleic acid is a double strand, and the double strand twists on itself like a ladder, and that's why it's called a double helix. Now, both of these types of molecules are made up of subunits called nucleotides. So what are nucleotides? Nucleotides have three sections, and the first portion right here is the phosphate group. The second portion here is the sugar, which in this case is deoxyribose for DNA. It would be just a ribose sugar for RNA. And then this last portion right here is something called the nitrogen base. The nitrogen base is variable because there are four types that it could be. In DNA specifically, the four types are listed right here. They're adenine, thymine, cytosine, or guanine. So think of this as like a little jigsaw puzzle. On the left and right, you can see that the phosphate and the deoxyribose are constantly repeating. So sometimes that's referred to as a sugar phosphate backbone. So there's uh, phosphate, then sugar, then phosphate, then sugar, then phosphate, then sugar, and that forms the backbone of the molecule. Those are bonded to each other. Then projecting off of the sugars are these nitrogen bases, and that's what makes it unique. That's what makes the code of DNA. And that code can be abbreviated with A, T, C, and G. The exact sequence of the code is unique to that individual, so everyone's DNA is unique, and we can read the code to determine what kind of protein is going to be coded for by that gene. So the idea is that this DNA molecule is a really, really long molecule, and one section of it will code for one specific gene. Now, why do I also have RNA in this picture? Because RNA is an alternative type of molecule that's going to be used to copy DNA, and the main difference between RNA, as I mentioned, it's single-stranded, but also it has a different nitrogen base called uracil. So you're gonna see uracil instead of thymine. The last piece of information you should know mm -hmm. is that these two sides are going to pair up. So the left and right sides in DNA, the way they pair up, there's specific pairing rules. So A is always gonna match up with T. You can see that here. So the A, A bonds with T, A bonds with T. While G always pairs with C, and my little trick for remembering that is that A and T are both kind of sharp angular letters and G and C are both kind of curvy letters. And so I know those guys always pair together. When you get to, your, uh, to RNA though, don't forget that RNA has uracil instead of thymine. So it would be A with U if we're looking at RNA. All right, so what's the purpose of DNA? It is this molecule that carries your genetic information, but it's important that you are able to copy it. And that's because your cells copy themselves. And uh, for example, when you're growing or when you're healing, you need more cells. How do you get more cells? The cell is going to split into two. If you don't copy the DNA, then each new cell would not have enough DNA. So you have to copy the DNA first before cell division occurs. This is called DNA replication. The image on the left is showing you what's happening. What's really cool is this is the original DNA strand here. And it's going to unzip just like a zipper. Okay, there's special proteins that unzip it. And each side of that zipper is going to be copied. So you end up with a new strand here and a new strand here. And you end up basically with two identical DNA strands. How does this work? Well, when the molecule is being built, like I said, those pairing rules apply. 
So the molecule can only match up with the correct nitrogen bases. So let's look at an example. Down here is just one side. Okay, this, is, this would be one side of the DNA molecule. And what we're asking here is what would be what's called the complementary side. So the complementary side would match up with this DNA. So if we read this DNA from left to right, you can see it's T, A, A, C, T, G, C, A, G, G, T. So what would be the matching side? Do you remember your pairing rules? T should match up with A. A always matches with T. C always matches with G and so forth. See if you can finish up the rest of this molecule. Have you figured it out? Let's go ahead and go over the answers. So this one should be C, then G, T, C, C, and finally A. So because this happens on both sides of the zipper, the final two DNA molecules are completely identical. Now, what happens if there's a mistake? Of course, mistakes can happen. And in DNA, when there's a mistake, you get something called a mutation. So think of it just as if you were copying down something. Maybe you were copying down a definition and you made a typo. It happens, right? And normally you catch yourself. Well, the DNA is the same way. It can proofread the new DNA molecule that it just made to try to correct any errors. And because of this, it's actually really, really good at being accurate during the copying process. But because DNA is such a long molecule and there are millions and millions and millions of these nitrogen bases in it, mutations do happen sometimes. So an example of a mutation would be that up here we have the original sequence and where there should have been a thymine, we accidentally inserted a cytosine. This mutation may or may not be harmful. It depends on what the effects are. And we're not gonna know the effects until we get to our protein. So what is DNA and how is it related to chromosomes? As I mentioned to you, DNA is this double helix, but that's what it would look like if you zoomed in on it a lot. Um, a regular microscope will actually not show you this shape because the molecule is too small. However, when inside of your cells, this molecule winds up and it winds up on these special proteins called histones, and it winds, 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 winds until you get this shape, which is actually a visible uh, underneath the microscope. So it's visible in a microscope. And that's your chromosome, which is the DNA all wound up. Think of like a long string of yarn, which you wound up to become a ball of yarn. And the reason the cell does this is because it needs to organize your DNA so the DNA doesn't get damaged during cell division. Why does it look like an X? There's actually a really good reason. This side of the DNA and this side of the DNA are identical copies. So we just talked about how the DNA unzipped and each side was copied, but those two copies are stuck together. And when they're stuck together, they look like an X. So oftentimes pictures of chromosomes look like an X because the two sides of those identical DNA strands are still stuck together. Okay, so it's just two strands stuck together. That happens before cell division. After cell division, it's gonna look like they've been pulled apart. So each one will only be half of an X. So this would be before cell division. And the two sides of the X actually do have another name. They're called sister chromatids. Going back to the idea of being able to see these underneath of a microscope, you can actually use chromosomes to help identify species. So the way we can identify species is we can count the number of chromosomes that are inside of one cell. And this is unique to the species. So for humans, humans should have 23 pairs. So what do we mean by 23 pairs? They come in pairs because your DNA came from your mom and your dad. So basically mom gave you 23 chromosomes and dad gave you 23 chromosomes and those chromosomes pair up. So in total, 
how many chromosomes are inside of your cell? You should have 46 total. But when we take a picture of the chromosomes, what we do is we number them. And we actually number them by size. So chromosome number one is actually two chromosomes that are the largest, and they carry the same genetic information. Then chromosome number two, second largest, this carries different genetic information. And chromosome number three, four, five, and so forth. You go from numbers one through 22, and then the last one are actually called sex chromosomes. And that's because they determine the sex of the individual. Is the individual gonna be male or female? If they are XX, they are a female individual. If they're XY, they are a male individual. And the XX versus XY is very easy to identify because you can see here, the Y chromosome is much smaller than the X. So that's the only pair where the two don't match. In all of the other ones, they're about the same size, have the same pattern. You can see those little stripes. The stripes are how we are able to match them up. But if you're XX, the two sex chromosomes look like they match. If you're XY, the two sex chromosomes look like they are different sizes. Now let's move on to the cell cycle. Cell cycle is basically the life cycle of the cell. So let's say we start right here. When the cell is in something called interphase, that's its normal growth and doing the normal functions of the cell. So for example, if the cell is a liver cell, maybe it's producing bile for you. If the cell is a pancreas cell, maybe it's producing insulin for you. So it has a certain job in the body and it's doing that job. While it's growing, it can also increase in size. Then it moves on to, so this is growth phase, it's growing. Then it can uh, reproduce its DNA. So the DNA copies itself. This is when it's getting close to getting ready to divide. Okay, so the DNA has to copy itself. And then we get to the second growth phase. After that, interphase is over and cell division begins. So this is cell division. Cell division is called mitosis, and it's going to have its own four phases. So there's four steps. And we're going to abbreviate those steps as PMAT. At this stage, when you're getting ready for mitosis, the chromosomes do become visible. So you would kind of see these X-like structures in the center of the cell. So what are the four steps of mitosis? PMAT refers to prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. Prophase is when the chromosomes become visible and the nucleus disappears. So basically the nuclear membrane dissolves. Metaphase is when the chromosomes line up in the middle. Anaphase is when they are pulled apart. So the sister chromatids are pulled apart. It no longer looks like an X. It looks like two halves of an X. And then telophase is when the cell uh, forms two new nuclei and then the cell's gonna pinch in and separate into two completely new cells. So you can kind of see some of these here, though not, not that great, but this would be kind of like prophase. This is like metaphase, though it didn't line up great, but it's supposed to be lining up in the middle. Then this is anaphase because they're being pulled apart. And then telophase is when they're separated. Okay, so now how is mitosis different from meiosis? So mitosis happens because this is normal cell division. You started off with one cell and at the end, you end up with identical cells. So you're undergoing mitosis if you wanna make more of the exact same kind of cell. You started with a skin cell, you end with a skin cell. Well, you actually end up with two skin cells, right? Or you start with a liver cell, you end up with two liver cells. They're completely identical. They'll have the same function, the same DNA, everything same, same, same. In comparison, meiosis is something that we use if we wanna produce a type of cell, cell called a gamete. So gamete is sex cells. So this is a much rarer type of cell division. Mitosis happens all the time in the body when you're trying to grow or heal. Gamete production only happens in the gonads. So gonads are the reproductive organs. So that would be the testis in the male, right? It's the, where the sperm are produced, or it would be the ovary in the female where the eggs are produced. Once meiosis is complete, you get four sex cells, but they are unique. So they're not gonna be identical to each other. In addition, they're going to be something called haploid. So they all start off diploid. 
That means they have the full number of chromosomes here. So in this case, the full number of chromosomes is four. Haploid means you only end up with half of the chromosomes. And you can see there's only two chromosomes in each of these cells. So you started off with four, but you end up with only two in each cell. That's because in meiosis, you're trying to reduce the number of chromosomes because the egg has to have half of the chromosomes, the sperm has to have half of the chromosomes, so that when they fuse together to form a zygote, then that new individual will have the full set of chromosomes again. If you didn't undergo meiosis correctly, you could end up with too many chromosomes, and that's actually a fatal situation. So we need to make sure we reduce the chromosome numbers correctly. This chart is comparing mitosis and meiosis, so let's talk about them again. Uh, what are some differences? Mitosis, the number of cell divisions is one. So basically you had a single cell, it divided once, and you got two unique cells, or sorry, two um, identical cells. In meiosis, it happens twice. So it divides, but then it divides again, so that you end up with four cells and they are unique. Okay, so remember meiosis, four unique haploid cells in mitosis, two diploid cells that are identical to each other. So two diploid, they're actually called daughter cells. Another uh, way of saying diploid, you'll see this term is 2N. It's 2N because you have two of each chromosome type. Then over here, we have four haploid daughter cells Notice it's just N because you only have one copy of each chromosome. So what is their purpose? Remember that for mitosis, it's for growth and healing, while for meiosis, it's only to produce gametes. This picture also shows some additional comparisons between the two. And it's a really nice way of looking at it because they color coded the chromosomes. So there's four chromosomes originally, two blue and two red, remember, because they come in pairs. And they're showing you here uh, metaphase lined up in the middle, right? And then over here, still 2N at the end. And you can see that the chromosome, which kind of looked like an X at the beginning, now they look like half Xs at the end. So that's for mitosis. On the other side, for meiosis, very similar, except that it had to split twice. Okay, so it's split here and then it's split again here to get four. We also have a special situation called crossing over where little bits of DNA get exchanged. So what that means is if you look really closely at this image at the very bottom, see how the blue chromosome has a little piece of red on it and the red chromosome has a little piece of blue on it? That means that they've exchanged some DNA. Crossing over only happens in meiosis. You never get that in mitosis. Because if you did that in mitosis, the two resulting cells would not be identical to each other. And we want them to be identical. But in meiosis, this allows us to have more diversity, more uniqueness in those gametes. Now that we're done with cell division, let's go back to the normal functioning of a cell. The purpose of the cell during its life depends on what kind of specific cell it is. So it has to make proteins for the body. Let me give you one example. Pancreas cells have been programmed to produce a protein called insulin. You need insulin to be able to regulate your blood sugar. So you've probably heard of that. There are people with a condition called diabetes where the insulin is not working properly for them. Either they don't have enough or the body has become resistant to the insulin and it's no longer doing its job. So this protein is really, really important. Now, how does the pancreas cell know to make this protein? The information is in its DNA. So pretend that this image right here is the DNA inside of a pancreas cell. What the DNA can do is it can unzip to expose one specific gene. So it unzips to expose the gene that codes for insulin. And it would have many other genes as well coding for other important things to keep the cell alive. But in this case, we're gonna look at the insulin gene. When this gene is exposed, 
This is a DNA molecule, but something new has to happen. It needs to make a copy of itself. And to make a copy of itself, it's going to use that other molecule we talked about called RNA. So these little pieces right here are pieces of RNA. And what they're going to do is they're going to copy the gene. And so you can see here, they're making a copy of the gene. And this molecule called mRNA has now copied one gene, one single gene. That process is called transcription. Okay, so that's what has just happened. So this right here is showing you transcription. Once the mRNA has copied that single gene, it's going to leave the nucleus. So this is inside of the nucleus. Well, this is outside in the cytoplasm. When the RNA has left the nucleus, what it's going to do is it's going to search for a ribosome molecule. This right here is the ribosome molecule. The mRNA, which is right here, is going to attach to that ribosome. So the mRNA and the ribosome are attached together and the ribosome is going to read the code on that mRNA molecule to help produce the protein. That process is called translation. Okay, so that's happening outside of the nucleus. The ribosome is gonna read that mRNA and it's going to help to assemble the protein. How does it do that? Well, it's going to need the help of another type of RNA molecule. And that other type of RNA molecule right here is called tRNA. And what the tRNA does is it carries amino acids, which I'm gonna abbreviate AA. So it's gonna carry amino acids. Amino acids are the building blocks of a protein. So in the top right, here where it says amino acids, each of those little tiny circles is one amino acid. There are 20 different types of amino acids. So imagine that there's 20 different colors of these little circles and how you assemble them together in this thing that looks almost like a necklace, that's called a polypeptide chain. So that's basically your protein. So the amino acids are all lined up in this polypeptide chain that's gonna form your protein. But we need the instructions on how to build this. So what order does it go? So for example, here, it's showing me it should be this orange, then the green, then the blue, then the yellow. How do I know that order? I know that order because that information is on the mRNA molecule. The mRNA molecule copied the code from the DNA. And the mRNA molecule has those letters, the A, C, T, uh, the A, C, G, and U that we talked about previously. And we're gonna read those letters to get our correct amino acid sequence. So this picture right here is just zooming in on transcription so you can get a better idea of it. Notice that when you build this RNA molecule, don't forget that RNA does not have a T in it, it only has U's. So when it copied the original sequence ATG, it actually copied it over as UAC. So the matching side, remember, there's no Ts in RNA. It has uracil instead. Again, zooming in on what's happening, you can actually see three sections of those letters together form something called a codon. And we can read one codon, and then we can read the next codon, and then we can read the next codon, and so forth. Think of it as like little words in the mRNA's language. So each of those three letters is its own word. Those words match up with the three letters on that tRNA. So remember, this was the tRNA. The tRNA has what's called the anticodon. So this is the anticodon, while the three on the mRNA are the codons and they match up perfectly, just like puzzle pieces. So when they match up, what happens is that is the place where that specific amino acid goes. So this codon right here ended up creating this amino acid in that position. This one says that, this, so this was number one, this would be number two, and then this would be number three and so forth. So it always matches up with the correct amino acid that's in the next part of the sequence. Once you have the full mRNA red, that whole long molecule is now called a polypeptide, which is a subpart of a protein. So let's do an example together. To do this, you would need something called a codon chart. 
and no one would expect you to memorize this code on chart, okay? It would always be provided for you if we needed you to do this activity. But basically what we would give you is we would give you the DNA sequence and then we would ask you what protein results from this DNA sequence. So step number one, you have your DNA. We know that from DNA, we have to make an RNA molecule. What was that process called? How do you get an RNA molecule from a DNA molecule? Do you remember what it's called? That's the process of transcription. So to transcribe it, we have to find the matching letters. So what pairs with G? Do you remember? G should pair with C. What about T? What pairs with T? It should be A. So now we have our first codon. Then we keep reading. G should pair with C then G. Next one gets tricky. You might've thought A pairs with T, but don't forget that RNA doesn't have a T, it only has a U. Then T pairs with A, A pairs with U, and C pairs with G. Now we are done with transcription. Our next process is going to be to translate it. So to go from RNA to our amino acid sequence, that's called translation. And that's what requires our codon chart. So we have to read the codons. The first codon is CAA. So we need to look at our chart and find out where the CAA codon is. So the first letter is C. The second letter is C, or sorry, it's not, uh, it's C, then A, and then a again. So C, A, A should form that one, G, L, N. That's our first amino acid. The next one is C, G, U. Can you figure out where C, G, U is on this codon chart? So first position, again, is over here, C. Then we have G, and then we have U. So CGU should be this amino acid. And finally, the last one, AUG. What does AUG stand for? Did you get all of those right? This can take a little bit of time to get used to. So I would recommend practicing using the codon chart to make sure you're comfortable with reading it. So as we mentioned, this is the result of the transcription and translation process we finally end up with the amino acid or polypeptide. So the amino acid sequence, which forms this polypeptide, that's not the final structure of the protein. This is the first level of structure. It's called the primary structure. It's simply the sequence of those amino acids. After that, the amino acids will bond to each other to form different shapes. So the second level of structure is something called alpha helixes and pleated sheets. Then it continues to wind up and kind of coil up. You get your tertiary structure. And finally, you can even get a quaternary structure, which is when multiple polypeptides bond together. So for example, this is one polypeptide here and here's another polypeptide and together they form the final protein. So why am I telling you this? Because it relates to some different human diseases that we're gonna learn about. On the right, we have a hemoglobin molecule. Hemoglobin molecules are responsible for carrying oxygen. They're found in your red blood cells and they can bind up to four oxygen molecules. How do they do this? They actually have four of these primary proteins. So there's four of them, four in hemoglobin. That's why they're represented in different colors here. So the tan, the dark brown, the purple, and the pink, those are each polypeptide chains that have come together. 
And the shape of this molecule is really important. If you have a malformed hemoglobin molecule, you cannot carry oxygen properly. And the most famous case of this is something called sickle cell anemia. So we talked about mutations before. Take a look right here. The original DNA sequence ended up getting a mutation. And because of that mutation, the codon was changed. And because of the codon change here, we end up with a different amino acid. So if you take a look and you compare, all of the other amino acids here are identical, same, 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 until you get to the uh, glutamic acid, which has been changed to valine in the mutant version. And the result is that this is what happens to the red blood cells. They change their shape. And that abnormal shape causes um, a lot of illness in the person and they get a disease called sickle cell anemia. So here's a review question for you. The process in which messenger RNA is read and an amino acid chain is formed is called which? A, RNA processing, B, transcriptase, C, transcription, D, translation. So the correct answer should have been translation. Remember that transcription means to make the RNA, but here we're making the amino acid chain, that's actually translation. Next, let's talk about genetics. We previously talked about how Mendelian genetics has been combined with Darwin's natural selection theory for the modern synthesis. However, you might not know too much about what Mendel did. So what he did is he studied the genetics specifically of pea plants. And in the image, you can see some of the traits that he looked at. He looked at things like purple flowers versus white flowers, green seeds versus yellow seeds, and uh, tall versus short plants. So while he was breeding these plants together, he noticed some important conclusions. And his conclusions were that certain traits seem to disappear and later reappear. And we've learned that this is due to recessive genes. So when an individual has a recessive gene, it can be hidden inside of their DNA where you can't physically see that they have that gene, but later the recessive gene can make a reappearance in the descendants of that person. We can also use Punnett squares to help predict what would happen between the mating of different individuals. So there's some important vocab here that I'm gonna quickly go over. An allele is a specific version of a gene. So it's a version of one gene. In this example, the gene is for color. So the gene is for color and the allele can either be purple allele or white allele. So those are the two versions of the gene. Phenotype is what does it look like? So the trait that is observable. In this case, the trait is either purple or white flower. The genotype is what all the genes are. Okay, so all the genes inside of that individual. The genes are represented by letters. So the dominant allele, this would be the dominant allele for purple is big B. The recessive allele for white would be the small letter B. Because you have two copies of every gene, don't forget you always have two copies, one from mom, one from dad. So inside of the individual, they could either be two dominant alleles, that would be big B, big B, that would be dominant, homozygous dominant, or they could be homozygous recessive, meaning they have two copies of that white allele, or they could be heterozygous. So heterozygous means they have one of each copy. Just because you have one of each, we still have to figure out what you look like. So in the case of a Mendelian gene like this, a heterozygous individual will always look like the dominant version. So dominant shows while the recessive is hidden. So what do we mean by that? So in this Punnett square at the top, 
what we have is we have a big B little B plant that mated with a big B little B plant. So what do we mean by mated? We mean that they pollinated each other. So these are plants, right? And there's actually the male part of the plant is the pollen itself. And then the pistil is the female part of the plant. That's where you put the pollen. And usually bees do that, right? But Mendel did it himself. He just took like a little paintbrush. And when you fertilize this plant, you can get offspring. So the offspring are gonna be the seeds. So then you plant the seeds and you see what happens to those new baby plants. What color are they? So the Punnett score will predict what will happen. So when we pair these two plants together, the male gave a big B and the female gave a big B, you could get a big B, big B plant. That one would be purple. We can also have these two individuals, which are heterozygous, but because they're heterozygous, don't forget that the dominant one shows. So purple is dominant to white. So those ones also look purple. And then only this little guy right here would show the recessive phenotype. So only 25% chance, because there were four in the box, right? So one out of four, 25% chance of the recessive phenotype showing up of being a white plant. What that means is you can have this prediction that if you put two of these purple plants together to mate, 25% of their offspring will end up being white, but 75% will show the dominant trait, which is purple. Now we can apply this to human genetic disorders as well. So these are some examples of genetic disorders that follow these same rules. Alpha thalassemia is a genetic disorder that is recessive. And what it does is it also mutates the hemoglobin molecule, kind of like what we saw with sickle cell anemia, but it's a different gene. Cystic fibrosis is a condition where the person gets ill because they have mucus build up in their lungs and in their pancreas. What that gene codes for is a specific chloride transporter molecule. So they have an imbalance in chloride, which causes this mucus. That is also a recessive condition. Hemophilia, we previously talked about, is a bleeding condition. So what happens there is the gene has a mutation and you're missing a clotting factor, which causes you to bleed abnormally. Huntington's disease is a disease that affects the brain. So there's a malformed protein in the brain that causes the brain cells to start to die. And over time, the condition gets worse and worse and is eventually fatal. This one's actually dominant. So this one's a dominant condition. These two are recessive. And this one is something called X-linked. Sickle cell anemia, we previously talked about, that is a recessive condition. So let's see if you can answer this question. When two heterozygous parents reproduce, what type of offspring can they produce? So basically you're saying, if a big B, little b mates with a big B, little b, what are all the different possible combinations the offspring could be? A, homozygous only, B, heterozygous only, C, hemozygous only, or D? both heterozygous and homozygous. If you're not sure, I suggest go back and look at the Punnett square that we had in the previous slide. So the correct answer should be both. Next question, let's see if you can figure this one out. NF1 syndrome is an autosomal dominant condition, which means that everyone born with a mutation in the gene, whether inherited or spontaneous, has a blank chance of passing the syndrome on to each of their children. Take a minute to think about this. The key term here is that it's a dominant condition. So what chance would there be of passing it on? So if you're not sure, let's try to use our Punnett square again. So for this, let's use the letters big N and little n. The big N would be this disease because it's dominant. The little n would just mean that you're healthy. So they're saying that a person who has the disease, so they have one big N, one little n, if they're married to someone else and they want to have children together, let's assume that the other person is healthy. So they would just have the normal versions of 
the allele. Let's see what happens. So you can go ahead and fill in this Punnett square. How many of their children would have the disease? Can you figure it out? So anybody who has a big N in their genotype would automatically have the disease. That means that two out of the four children would end up having the disease. So the answer to this question should have been 50%. Now there are genes that are more complex than the Mendelian pattern. So in Mendelian, there was only two options. Either it was a dominant version or a recessive version. But we know that that's not true for every trait that exists. There are examples of something called incomplete dominance. In incomplete dominance, you can get an intermediate trait. So something that's in between that dominant and recessive versions that we were just looking at. An easy example is snapdragons, where if you mix a red and a white snapdragon, you can end up with an intermediate color of pink. So it's not that the red is dominant to the white, but it's not that red is recessive to white either. It's that red and white both show up in the intermediate trait of pink, which is an in-between stage. There's also something called codominance. In codominance, again, one allele is not stronger than the other. Instead, both of them show up. So an example of this would be in human blood types. If you have the A allele and the B allele, it's not that A is stronger than B. Both of them are equally strong, they're codominant. So you will have something called AB blood type because both will show up in your phenotype. There's also something called X-linked. X-linked is special because X-linked is found on the X chromosome. Because of the fact that females have two X chromosomes, while males only have one, it's gonna change how that gene affects the males and males are gonna be more likely to have X-linked disorders than females do. Because females have a second X, they have a much higher chance of having a healthy copy of the allele, while with males, if they have the diseased X chromosome, that's it, they have no other version of it, so they automatically end up getting the illness. There are also examples of polygenic traits. That means that there are actually many, many genes working together. So that's true for a lot of human traits. For example, your eye color is not just one gene, it's many genes. Same is true for your hair color. That's why we have so many types of hair color, not just a few. And height, there's something like a couple hundred, maybe even like 700 genes involved in height. So that's why we have such a wide range. And of course, environment can affect it as well. So things like nutrition would affect how much you grow, not just your genes. We talked about that term epigenetics, the idea that even if the genetics is identical, how it's expressed can be influenced by the environment. So next we're going to look at pedigrees. Pedigrees are a way to look at things like genetic disorders across multiple generations of a family. So when we were looking at a Punnett square, we only looked at the two parents and their children. With pedigrees, you can look at grandparents, brothers and sisters, nephews, nieces, grandchildren, all sorts of things to help figure out what the pattern is of that illness. So let me look at three different examples for you. Huntington's, Huntington's disease, we said, is a dominant disorder. Cystic fibrosis is recessive and muscular dystrophy is actually X-linked. I'm gonna show you how you can identify this pattern in the family tree. In a dominant pedigree, you're going to see that if a person has it, let, let me rephrase, if a person has it, their, one of their parents must have it, okay? So if a person has it, one parent, must have it, right? So it can't be that you have it and neither of your parents had it. And you can see that rule, this child got it from this parent who got it from this parent. These two children actually have two parents with it, but that's okay, that still satisfies the rule that at least one parent must have it. In a dominant illness, you can also see that two people with the trait 
can have a child without. So that would be this individual right here. They have two parents with it, but they ended up not having it. That's just like the, the purple plant having a white flower child. With a recessive, you can have a person who has it and neither parent has it. So this person has it, but neither of their parents have it. That's because it was recessive, it was hidden. So you actually have something called carriers. Carriers are individuals who only have one copy of the gene. So two parents that are carriers can have a child that has that disease. We also see that it can skip generations. For example, the grandparents don't appear to have it, but that's because they are also carriers. Finally, for X-linked, the most common pattern you'll see is that only males get it. It's actually super rare for females to get this disease. So you'd almost only exclusively see males in the family getting it. The only way a female could get it would be if her father has it and her mother must be a carrier.